Okay, we're moving into Standard 5C. In Standard 5C, you will be able to describe East Asia, which includes China and the Japanese shogunate. China and Japan are going to limit the influence and the activities of European merchants within their borders. So for China, they're going to limit European contact. The exploration of India led to great opportunities for trade. Once those were established, the European traders began searching for new sources of wealth. Europeans began to seek trade relationships with the Chinese and then later the Japanese. So let's talk about China. So China is going to welcome the European people into their country for trading purposes. And China is going to create what's called an enclave, which is a distinctly bounded area enclosed within a larger unit. And this is how China is going to control trade within its borders. So an example of an enclave is right here, Section C. Notice Section C, it's got his, its own little area. Let's say the Portuguese are permitted to trade in Enclave C. The Portuguese are not permitted to trade out here. They're not permitted to trade out here. They're not permitted to trade out here. They're only permitted to trade within this enclave. And notice the enclave is this distinctly bounded area within the larger unit, which would be area A. There was an imperial policy of controlling foreign influences and trade within China. There's also going to be an increasing demand in Europe for Chinese goods. So goods such as tea, silk, and porcelain, AKA that fine China maybe your parents only pull out for a Thanksgiving meal or a fancy family sit down dinner. So the Ming Dynasty, we need to talk about this dynasty just really quickly. It's going to be around from 1368 to 1644. The Ming rulers are not going to allow the outside forces to upset the peace that they had brought to China by overthrowing Mongol rule. So they don't want the European people to come into their country willy-nilly trading wherever they want. They're going to really set boundaries for these foreigners coming in to their country. So here's the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty is going to be this lightly gray shaded area. So what you need to do is make sure this area is distinctly drawn out on the map in your notebook. So maybe shaded in with like a highlighter or a colored pencil. Make it stick out. So a person we need to talk about is Zheng He. Zheng He is a Chinese Muslim. He is going to lead seven voyages for China. His expeditions were known for their size. Everything is large. So they covered a great distance in their travel. The fleet size, the number of boats that they had was a big number. And the actual ship measurements itself was quite large. In fact, they are known as the treasure junks. Everywhere that Zheng He went, he is going to receive tribute. He's going to return to China with gifts from over 16 countries. Unfortunately for Zheng He, the emperor felt that the voyages were way too expensive and that it wasted resources that could be used to fend off the barbarians. So in 1433, the emperor is going to end the voyages of Zheng He, and China is going to go into a period of isolation. So here is a picture of Zheng He. And up here is a map of Zheng He's travels, all these red lines. They show you where he went throughout this area of the world. It is even thought that he made it to the Americas before Columbus, we don't have accurate information on that. 
Jung Ho's ship. Here it is. Look at this ginormous boat. It is huge. And here it is compared to Christopher Columbus's ship, the Nina, the Pinta, and or the Santa Maria. All right. It is very small. Columbus had a very small ship compared to Jung Ho's treasure junk. All right, so the Ming in isolation. During the Ming dynasty, the influence of foreigners was kept to a minimum because only the government is allowed to trade. Major amounts of trading is going to occur on the black market, which is going to cause the silk and ceramics industries to explode. So the black market is uh, very similar to a black market today. It's an illegal market. They're selling goods illegally. And so these European people really wanted silk. They really wanted that porcelain, that fine china, those ceramic plates and bowls. They needed those goods to bring back to Europe. And the only way they could get it is to purchase this on the black market. So to purchase it illegally. Along with the illegal trade, missionaries are going to begin to spread Christianity along the coast of China. There is one Jesuit monk, Matteo Ricci. He was very influential because of his favor with the government and his ability to speak Chinese. So the Chinese government allowed Matteo Ricci to come into China and to spread Christianity. All right, the next dynasty we need to talk about is the Qing dynasty, like Cha Qing. It's going to be around from 1644 all the way until 1912. In 1644, the Manchus are going to invade China, and quickly the Ming Dynasty is going to fall. So the Qing Dynasty, this family, is going to be the last family or dynasty to rule China. Here is the Qing Dynasty, its borders. So just like with the Ming Dynasty, I want you to take out like a highlighter, a colored pencil, whatever you have to make these boundaries stick out on your map. So it is going to be this lighter gray color. This is the Qing Dynasty. The Manchus continue isolation. If foreigners wished to trade in China, they would have to follow Chinese rules. Makes sense. Follow the rules. You get to do what you want. The Dutch, which are the people from the Netherlands, they were willing to follow the Chinese customs. So the Chinese welcomed the, the Dutch to trade in China. Over 80% of the trade was in tea, but silk and and porcelain were also prized goods. The British are going to refuse to pay tribute to the Chinese emperor. They are going to be unable to trade within China's borders. But because of the black markets, Britain was able to trade illegally. And they did so by using opium, which is a drug made from the poppy flower, which they grew in India. They were able to get the Chinese hooked on opium, and they were able to sell it and trade it in the black market for the goods that they wished to bring back to Great Britain. All right, let's quickly cover Japan. So Japan is going to return to a period of isolation. In 1467, a civil war is going to shatter the feudal system in Japan. 1467 to 1568, it was a period of violence in which Japan was in complete disorder. But order is going to be brought back to Japan when warrior chieftains called daimyos came to power. Here is Japan. Japan, it's an island, and it's off the coast of China and the Koreas, both north and south. Here it is. Here's Japan. The daimyo system. 
It's going to be similar to feudalism in which each lord gives protection to the peasants in return for them working the land. So eventually a group of daimyo are going to join forces and they are going to be able to unite all of Japan. The Tokugawa Shogunate. So Japan's emperor, he was powerless and he was going to be controlled by the military leader, which is the Shogun. Japan was united under the Tokugawa Shogunate. And under this government, the daimyo still ruled at the local level, but the Shogun are going to rule all of Japan. Their contact with Europe. So during the period of disorder, the Japanese are going to welcome traders and missionaries from Portugal and other European countries into Japan. The Japanese are going to trade the Portuguese for firearms, which they could use as protection during the violent period. And firearms, we are referring to guns. Missionaries were also welcome because the Japanese associated them with the traders who brought guns. So again, missionaries are people who want to spread the word of the Jesus, spreading Christianity. So when the shogunate was established, missionaries were repressed because the shogun did not want to compete with Christianity for power. So they're going to close the country. In 1639, the Japanese are going to set up a closed country policy. The shogun no longer allowed traders or missionaries to enter the country. Japanese citizens were also not allowed to leave the country. So it, it is a complete closed country. Nobody's allowed in, nobody's allowed out, and they're able to do so because Japan is an island. They can close their borders. Nobody in, nobody out. So isolation, for over 200 years, Japan remained isolated, completely cut off from the rest of the world in order to limit foreign influence. Japan did not want foreign influence coming into their country, so they became self-sufficient, meaning they were able to provide everything they needed on their own. They needed nothing from anybody else. They were self-sufficient. Okay, that ends our talk on China and our talk on Japan and how they isolated themselves and controlled trade within their boundaries. So I look forward to talking to you about this next class. Enjoy, kids.